couple devoted to God and each other. He always put her first in his life. Then a break-in and a brutal murder. I think my wife has been killed off in the third week. Uh, it, it was, it was vicious. Police suspect her husband, a respected church leader, but can they prove it? We didn't have the murder weapon. We didn't have any forensic evidence. Was the wrong man facing jail? I didn't do anything. What happened to the preacher's wife? Plus, a loving husband and young father vanishes into thin air. Nicholas Francisco is missing. If you can't find him, these kids don't have a daddy then. His disappearance reveals secrets almost too troubling to be true. How did I not see this stuff? Love and lies. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. We all know that marriage can be filled with ups and downs. Still, no one expects their union to shatter the way it did for the couples you're about to meet. First, Kelly Jarka, a family man and a devoted Jehovah's Witness. But when his wife ends up dead, the evidence points to him. Is it a rush to judgment? As Jim Avila first reported in 2009, Nothing in this story of the preacher and his wife is quite as it seems. Master bedroom, bathroom. Master bedroom, bed. Blood stain on the pillow. A spring morning, police rummage through what's been reported as a home invasion the peaceful, pious world of Jehovah's Witness minister Kelly Jarka, his wife Isabel, and their two children, now a frantic mess. Their upscale home in the faraway Los Angeles suburb of Marietta is now filled with disheveled drawers, ransacked cabinets, and more. 911, what is your emergency? Hello? Yes, can we put it on battery? You were just robbed? Yes. Dew is still on the lawn at 8.45 that morning as Kelly Jarka returns from a neighborhood coffee shop to find what he says are all the signs of a burglary gone wrong. I could hear the baby was crying, so I yelled out to Isabel, you know, uh, Isabel, you know, what's wrong with the baby? And, uh, and then as I proceeded up the stairs, I found her. So you go up to the top of the landing, that's where your master bedroom is? Uh -huh. and. What do you see there? Uh, it's where I found uh, Isabel lying in the, in the landing by the bedroom. Okay, what happened? Somebody, I don't know, I just got home. I pulled in, somebody tried to help. Okay, was somebody there that held you at gunpoint or were you burglarized? I was, I was not there. You weren't there? No. Okay, so your house has been burglarized. Yes. But as okay. you were about to hear, 30 seconds into that 911 call, Kelly Jarka reveals one more detail. I think my wife has been killed. A what, sir? I think my wife has been killed. Okay, what are you seeing? I think my wife has been killed in the third week. She was home alone with me. Okay, do you see her? She's lying on the ground with blood underneath her. Okay, is she breathing? No. Is she bleeding? Yes. Is there anyone else in the house? No, my sister is my in-laws next door. What happened? I walked in the house, the baby was crying. I picked him up with a to look for my wife. In the house has been, been everything's torn up. I tried to move her and, and uh, um, shake her and see if uh, she responded. Uh, and she didn't. Did you talk to her at all? Yeah. What were you saying to her? Isabel, Isabel, you okay? Kelly? Oh my God. Okay, Kelly, take a deep breath. Okay, I have a lot of people on the way to see you, okay? Where's your baby? Kelly, where's your baby? <laughs> the terrifying screams you hear are from Isabel's mother, Tina Conchola, who lives across the street from the Jarkas. Kelly runs to her house as he's talking to 911. Kelly, who's that in the background? It's my, it's my mother-in-law. And when I uh, got to the last uh, stair, I said, Isabel, sweetie, answer me. Can you hear me? Move if you hear me. And she couldn't. She was already there. But I, I didn't want to believe it. But she knows it's true and is already seething. 
Tina Canchola has made a snap decision about the murderer with no evidence. Right away, I, I figured that he would kill her. So what did you say to him? I say, you kill her. I know that you kill her. And he, of course, said, no, I didn't. Of course no, not. He didn't say nothing. He just looked at me like, like this. Why wouldn't he deny it? Because he knew that it was true. But why the rush to judgment? Is Tina just an angry mother-in-law who hates Kelly, and so she ignores all the evidence of a break-in? That's not the Kelly Jarka everyone else knew, a man so in love with his wife, he'd give her anything. This is their second anniversary party. We were young. She liked to uh, joke around. Next so in other words, next year, <laughs> so in other words, next year. Very kind, considerate person, happy. Of course, I thought she was beautiful. For Kelly, it is love at first sight, a Midwestern boy smitten by a California girl he met at church. Kelly was like always pursuing Isabel. <laughs> he, he was trying everything. Isabel's family says she likes being pursued. His family saw that too. Every time Isabel said, Kelly, I need this or I want that, he'd be like, okay, here dear, here's the credit card. He truly, absolutely loved her to death. A devoted couple to each other and to their God. Jehovah's Witnesses, the 40-year-old Isabel, a stay-at-home mom who loved to shop and spent the rest of her time preaching door-to-door, -door, proud that her husband was made an elder in their congregation. We are very uh, dedicated uh, to God. Uh, Matthew 6.33 says, Seek the kingdom first and all the other things will be added to you. And uh, everything always works out. And things are working out. Nearly 20 years of marriage. The Jarka family lives well on Kelly's salary as a contractor. Their brand new house in one of the safest communities in America could be considered a perfect target for burglars. It's filled with the best appliances. In the garage, two luxury SUVs and a pickup truck for work. And in a nearby marina, a 36-foot powerboat for weekends. Until on that spring morning, Kelly walks in on tragedy. It's obvious her head was on the pillow that she had to have been asleep when this happened. It's a vicious killing. Crime scene photos show what looks to lead detective Danny Martin like a crime of passion. Isabel Jarka was bludgeoned to death with 11 blows to the face and head. Overkill. It doesn't look like she was able to defend herself from the initial blow. And then it looks like she tried to crawl away from the assault. And she was repeatedly uh, being struck in the head uh, with a blunt force object. Police are already thinking the mother-in-law may be right. Their suspicion, too, turns to Isabel's husband, Kelly Jarka. He's not crying. He's not emotional in any way. He seemed very cold and just emotionless. When we return, the cold husband on the hot seat. Why would you want your wife dead? But behind closed doors, a secret emerges. What kind of calculated malignant mind is able to come up with this many unique ways to kill somebody? Stay with us. For 39-year-old Kelly Jarka, it has been a day like no other. He finds his wife brutally murdered after he makes a trip for coffee. I think my wife has been killed. Calls 911 and is immediately accused of murder by his mother-in-law and then rushed off to the police station where the cops let him sit so they can watch his body language. He's in the interview room 45 minutes after finding his wife, you know, brutally beaten and there's no emotion, kind of just uh, looking at the text messages, you know, moving his arms. I want to see, was his posture closed? Is he trying to hide something? Did you get a feeling he was trying to help you? No, I had a feeling that he was trying to limit his exposure. So when you're sitting there, why are you acting that way? I was in shock. I was concerned about what had happened. and I didn't know what to think. Now, the prosecution and even the police believe your affect was a demonstration of your guilt. Why is that not true? Because I'm not guilty of it, number, um, of course, number one. And, um, and I think our um, emotional state changes, especially under um, a dire circumstance, under a shocking event. I didn't do anything. When I came home, 
That's listen to me. Listen to me. Why would you want your wife dead? I don't. I, I don't. Detective Phil Gomez is not buying it, and within an hour of this 10-hour session, he tries to provoke Jarka into confessing. I think maybe you have something to do with this, and the evidence tells the truth. You know, the, the evidence on the body, the evidence in the house, the evidence, uh, the hairs, the, the skin, things like that. Problem is, detectives at the scene are coming up empty. All that evidence Detective Gomez is threatening is nowhere to be found and Assistant District Attorney Burke Strunsky knows he has little to work with. This was a completely circumstantial case. We didn't have the murder weapon. We didn't have uh, an eyewitness. Uh, we didn't have um, any forensic evidence that directly tied Mr. Jarka to the actual murder itself. But while, as the detective says, evidence doesn't lie, the lack of it can be artfully framed by a prosecutor. She is gushing blood from her head, and yet he doesn't have a drop of blood on him. You believe that the fact that there was no blood on him was actually indication of guilt. Why does that not speak to innocence? Here, the blood was confined to the area of the killing itself which means somebody prepared for the killing in some ways, had something to put the murder weapon in after committing the murder so that it wouldn't drip uh, blood to other areas. So in court, Prosecutor Strunsky concentrates on what he does have, lots of incriminating circumstantial evidence, beginning with what he considers his best witness, Kelly Jarkin, in the interrogation room. So please tell me what you remember. Um, got up this morning started getting, you know, calls from work, and I went to get a formula and uh, Starbucks. This part of Kelly Jarka's account of how the murder morning began can be documented. Police quickly get the surveillance tapes at both the Long's Drugs, where he bought baby formula, and then moments later, he's at the Starbucks buying himself a coffee and his wife a latte. But phone records subpoenaed by detectives show he did not spend the early morning on the telephone as he told Detective Gomez. The DA's chief investigator, Rodney Bishop, went over the printouts. He didn't make phone calls? No, he did not. I personally spoke to every single person that tried to get a hold of him that morning. And these people uh, did not speak with him, didn't get a hold of him, and uh, thought that was odd. So contrary to what he was telling you, not only was not on the phone, he wasn't answering the phone. He was not taking the phone calls, no. Next, the detectives go after the story of how Kelly says he first noticed signs of a break-in. And the door inside the house I saw was open, open half, like a cracked open. And then I saw the door that comes from the outside to the garage it was open also. In fact, that door from the side yard into the garage where the burglar supposedly came in appears to have been forced open, kicked in, leaving wood fragments on the garage floor. But police believe that Jarka kicked in that door to fake the burglary because on the bumper of the car Kelly says he was using at the time his wife was being murdered by a burglar is a small paint chip that matches the door frame. Which would indicate that when that door was forced open and the door jam falls onto the, the car that's already parked there, Mr. Jarka's vehicle, that's where the paint transfer came from. So the car was there, presumably he was there. Correct. And the police are especially skeptical of Kelly Jarka's next tape. And I see like everything's torn apart. The drawers are pulled out, you know, um, where jewelry cabinet was all thrown around. It's the kitchen area. Going in and seeing the scene and, and starting to think, hey, this looks staged. There were a great deal of drawers in the kitchen, the bedroom, um, that had been taken out and actually removed from their track. It was odd that somebody took the time to actually remove these from their the mechanism. They also think it's strange that the phantom burglar, as they call him, left behind $500 in a bedside table and a laptop computer while taking a much heavier and more difficult to sell desktop computer tower. But all that pales to this bombshell. What the prosecutor says is the clear motive for Isabel Jarka's death. We did it to make $1.3 million in insurance. Three weeks before Isabel was murdered, Kelly Jarka arranged for three new insurance policies on the wife he had never insured before. He is vague about them during his interrogation. Um, I don't even know who the policy is. We had a friend who got sick like a year or something ago. And so she wanted me to get life insurance and everything. But that's recently. It's probably not even in effect yet. I don't know. 
But the policies were in effect when Isabel died. And while Jarka told police he didn't know where his wife kept them, the documents were found in a file cabinet with his, not Isabel's, fingerprints on them. You, you would have to be an idiot to take out life insurance on somebody three weeks before. I don't know how anyone would think that they could do that and get away with it. But the prosecution claims Jarka was desperate enough to be reckless, high living, leaving him deeply in debt. He shows the jury this bank letter dated days before the murder, warning him that he is in default, two months behind on his mortgage. Things were really coming down to the wire as far as foreclosure on the house. And Isabel's mother says there was enough financial stress at home for her daughter to openly threaten divorce. Mom. If I go and uh, me and my kids to, to your house to live with you guys, do you agree for me to stay there? And I say, of course. Not enough incriminating circumstantial evidence yet? Here's another smoking gun. One of those laptops left behind is jammed with suspicious entries. Those searches give you a glimpse into the mind of a psychopath. The thought process that goes into even thinking about how many ways that he could kill his wife shows a demented resolve and planning to end Isabel's life. Among the shocking Google searches, poisons that cause instant death, how long to medically suffocate, how to drug overdose, can you suffocate from a pillow, cyanide and suicide, can a BB gun kill you? How long does it take to suffocate? The best way to die? And how long to wait to remarry? Chilly. I mean, what kind of calculated malignant mind is able to come up with this many unique ways to kill somebody? Even Jarka's own public defender, Aaron Kirkpatrick, was shocked by what was found on Kelly's computer. It's very harmful. When I saw the computer searches at first, I, I was very concerned. But just the computer searches alone is not enough evidence. Kelly Jarka spent a year in jail waiting for trial and then never took the stand to defend himself or proclaim his innocence. But he does sit down with 2020. And when we return, the fallen minister's first interview as we confront him with the evidence. Why would she be asking these questions? Stay with us. It all seems so far away. There you go. The Jarka's 19 years of happy marriage, suddenly a distant memory. 911, what is your emergency? Marred by Isabel's murder and the May 2008 arrest of her husband, Kelly. A nightmare that began with the early morning discovery of her body. As Kelly Jarka told police just an hour later. I ran over there and it's very, very much, you know, and, and I couldn't move her. Did you end up rolling her over? No. What did you notice about her head? Just that it was in, in all the blood. Did you think she was dead? Yeah, I thought she was shot or something happened to her. Is this a guilty man talking? How, how do you forget that you had to step over your wife's body, get your baby, come back with your baby, and then step over your wife's body again? Right. He left all that part out. The detectives say they are struck by his lack of emotion and odd behavior. They think it's circumstantial evidence of guilt. Everything is pointing towards you. I want to get a reaction from Mr. Jarka. An innocent person is not going to let me sit there and accuse them of brutally murdering their wife of 19 years. Uh, no, I, Jarka I says that's not true at all, that Gomez had already made up his mind and would not listen to his pleas of innocence. Watch. Okay, I, I didn't do anything. Listen to me right now, okay? I'm telling you right now, don't, okay? Don't tell me that you didn't know what was going on. Don't tell me you didn't have anything to do with this. Don't tell me that you didn't do anything. You can't tell me that because I'm not going to believe you and neither is anyone else. I'm Were the police rushing to judgment? Jarko holds to his story even when Detective Gomez lies, as police are allowed to by law during interrogations claiming forensic and direct evidence that simply did not exist. I'm telling you, there's all kinds of trace evidence out there. There's evidence under fingernails. There's evidence in, 
in, in, in carpet. There's evidence in beds. There's evidence all over the place, okay? What was the evidence against you? There was none. No physical evidence. They didn't find your DNA on your wife? No. Uh, Any hairs, fibers? No. Uh, uh, to find uh, a murder weapon? No. They tested me as soon as I was interviewed for DNA swabs, fingernails, hair, everything. I had no altercation marks or whatever um, on me. No blood, anything like that. And were there clothes found in your house with blood on them? No. How about the drains? Were those looked at? Um, yeah. Did they find any nothing, blood? Nothing. How about any bleach that might have been used to destroy the blood? Um, nothing. So there's no physical evidence that you either were covered with blood or tried to get rid of the blood in your house. Correct, as well as uh, in our vehicles. But what about all that damning circumstantial evidence? Kelly Jarka says the prosecution exaggerated his financial troubles, and in fact, a careful read of Jarka's records shows he was not in any danger of imminent foreclosure. Defense attorney Aaron Kirkpatrick. And then he make a payment, he might get a little behind. Um, I'm not dire. So was it fair to tell the jury that he was desperate and was being foreclosed upon? Absolutely not, because there's no evidence of it. Despite what his mother-in-law says, Kelly Jarka denies any serious marital trouble. And in fact, Isabel had never asked her church or a lawyer about divorce. Police were never called to the house for domestic violence. We never discussed divorce. We just had a six-month-old baby. Uh, we were happy. But what possible explanation could he have for those sinister computer entries about death, remarriage, and insurance payouts? First, he says the computer had no password on it and claims his wife made those horrific searches. Who was asking these questions then? Um, I would have to say Isabel. You know this woman pretty well. Mm -hmm. Why would she be asking? these questions. We did uh, co-sleeping with our baby. She was concerned for his safety as far as suffocation and things like that. When to remarry after death, she had a friend who lost uh, her husband in death. But there's a lot here about how to kill someone. There were also searches uh, at that exact same time for uh, things that only Isabel would search for. Beading, how to make necklaces, stores uh, like um, uh, Claire's, I think is one of them. Piles and piles of circumstantial evidence. A three-week trial filled with it, but nothing to connect Kelly Jarka directly to the murder. Are you surprised that you can go to prison for the rest of your life on circumstantial evidence alone? Very. To be able to uh, convict someone of a crime when there's no evidence against them other than a, a theory is, is unthinkable, especially in something so serious as this. You must impartially compare and consider all the evidence that was received throughout the entire trial. And just before the jury is sent to deliberate, a powerful message from the judge that should help Kelly about how circumstantial evidence is to be used. If there are two reasonable interpretations to that circumstantial evidence, and one of those interpretations points toward innocence, they must accept the one that points toward innocence. But it took the jury just three and a half hours to find the surprise Kelly Jarka guilty of first degree murder. The jury has reached the verdict, is that right? Yes, we have. To the jury, according to its foreman, Ron Fournier, Jarka's lies added up to guilt. There was no smoking gun, no eyewitness, no bloody clothes, no bloody murder weapon. But after three weeks of day after day after day being exposed to one lie after another, it just kept adding up and adding up that. This nice gentleman sitting over here could have done it. He's the only one who could have done it. So there was no dissension on anything. Not one person said, yeah, but a burglar could have done that. Not one. At the sentencing hearing in November 2009, his life in ruins, his ministry shattered, his children taken away and given to their aunt, Kelly Jarka made one final attempt at judicial mercy, sticking to his story that he was framed by circumstance and overzealous police for a crime he could never commit. Tragically, I have been accused of this horrendous crime, and that sickens me. Such a horrible thought cannot even come up into my mind or my heart. And now, with plenty of tears in his eyes, he professes his love for the wife he will never see again. My heart aches constantly. I long 
for her smile, her touch, her smell, her love. But the last word comes from the judge. Unimpressed by the lack of direct evidence, he tells Jarka the circumstantial was overwhelming. And the defendant's conduct and his actions of murdering his wife of nearly two decades and the planning and the deliberation, the deception, and coupled with that brutality and that violence and those horrific injuries that he inflicted on his wife are chilling and disturbing. Finally, after chastising Kelly Jarka for showing no remorse, he sent the fallen minister off to life in prison without parole, with these words ringing in his ears. The court can't offer any reason, any comfort other than to say pure evil. That's all it is, pure evil. People are going to remember this case because they're going to reflect for a moment. They're going to tremble when they hear the name People versus Kelly Lee Jarka. Kelly Jarka appealed his conviction and it was denied. The couple's children went to live with Isabel Jarka's sister and as of 2011 are reportedly doing well. Up next, a husband and a father who suddenly disappears. The search is on for a SeaTac tac father who's joined the search for a missing man as new. And he leaves behind a trail of secrets. There is a bit of a dark side um, to him, um, troubled. Stay with us. Imagine the last thing you hear from your husband is a call saying he's on his way home from work and he'll see you soon. Then silence. That is, until his deserted car is found and the tough questions really begin. Was it foul play or something even more sinister going on? Here with a story he first reported in 2010, Jim Avila. The search is on for a SeaTac. Dozens joined the search for a missing man as new clues. Also searching the bank and it roared across Seattle's front pages. Breaking news on TV. Not seen since Wednesday. February 2008. Family man Nicholas Francisco gone missing on his way home from work. Wednesday night today. Simply disappears. Search is still ongoing and he there's not any. He loves us more than anything. Who was this 28-year-old young man from the Northwest? He had built a life and family with Christine, a small town co-ed he met nine years earlier by chance at art school. In walks this guy, a very good looking guy. And honestly, my jaw dropped. Attractive and kind of funny, ready to joke around with the guys, like his best friend, Matt Donovan. He was a great guy to be around. He was kind of a little bit crazy. Um, the guy sticking his head out the window, yelling and screaming as we're driving. He says both Christine and Nick shared difficult childhoods. His father walked out on Nick when he was just 16, but that didn't scare him away from marriage. Two years after they met, Christine and Nick were wed. And you were deeply in love. I was, I was. He was everything that I had dreamed of. I felt like Cinderella. Christine's family secret, she says she'd been abused as a child but now had finally found someone she trusted in Nicholas. When you're a little girl and you're thinking about your knight in shining armor, he was it. Soon daughter Zaya was on the way, followed by son Noah. The Franciscos were regulars at a conservative church and Nicholas got a job as art director for the ad agency Publicis. He was a likable guy, he had a sense of humor. Likable, says his boss, Christina Muller Eberhard, yet a bit mysterious. There is a bit of a dark side um, to him, um, troubled, I, I should say. He kept a lot to himself. Perhaps he was worried about money. With two kids and Christine newly pregnant with a third, the family budget was stretched. Christine opened a home business making custom aprons and selling them online. And on February 13, 2008, she sends him off to work without complaint, not knowing it would be for the last time. And then he kissed me on the forehead, and he goes, oh, my poor sweet Bella, I love you. Just after 6 that night, Nicholas calls and promises to be home soon to bake Valentine's Day cookies with Noah and Zay. And she was excited because she loved to do things with her daddy, and Noah was excited. At the office, all is well. He seemed happy. He seemed actually in a pretty good mood. Um, and he was making jokes. While at home, Zaya, Noah, and Christine are waiting. The clock ticking. 
the cookie dough prime. When he didn't come home, what happened? She looks at me and she goes, Mommy, why didn't Daddy come home and make cookies? And at that point, I was a little irritated, a little angry, because he broke a promise. So by 9 o'clock, you're starting to get a little agitated. I, I, no, I, I was worried. I was really worried, because I wasn't like him. He always called me. She calls his cell phone repeatedly, but no one answers. So Christine finally puts the kids to bed. And at 10 o'clock, she calls 911. She said, if, if he's still missing in three hours, call us back. I said, OK. So I paced around my house for three hours. Christine does what she can, frantically calling hospitals, friends, and family. No one has heard a thing. And at 1 in the morning, now desperate, she calls police back. I said, you don't understand. He's not the same as every other man. This man wouldn't leave me. He wouldn't just walk out. Police react quickly for a missing persons case. Detective John Holland is assigned the next morning and finds little suspicious. We had no known motives. He wasn't in the drug world. No. He didn't have people who were on the outskirts of society. He wouldn't, didn't associate with them. No. He so was pretty much a homebody. That's correct. And outside the police station, an army of friends and family, church members and co-workers organize a massive search, led by family friend Lee Brown. Following his, uh, his usual route home, we cut that area up into like five different areas. We drove for probably a solid six hours. Missing posters go up. The ad agency where Nick worked hires a private eye and shuts down his entire department to hit the streets and hand out flyers. We were worried. We were really worried. One of your co-workers go missing. You know, you want to do something about it. Hi. We have a friend of ours that's been missing since Wednesday. I don't know if you've seen it on the news. Out-of-town friends show up, including best buddy Matt, who consoles Zaya and the very young but very concerned Noah. He asked where his dad was, and it just killed me. It tore me up inside because, like, I shouldn't have to answer this question for him. His dad should be here. Coworkers then the news media kicks in. First local TV. And if you can't find him, these kids don't have a daddy then. The Seattle paper. And the story goes national on the America's Most Wanted website. Suddenly, Christine is flooded with not only volunteers, but donations. The community was amazing. The donations kept flooding in. I was overwhelmed. Um, and not just financial. People brought clothes. They brought food. And they searched for your husband. They took their time, their efforts. They left their families for days. Amateur sleuths from around the country offer clues and plots. Some wonder if Nick's wife killed him. At least two psychics tell police he's dead. Police consider that too and bring Christine into the station for questioning. That was awful. To have a police car come up to my driveway. I've never had a speeding ticket. This is out of her world. Absolutely, without a doubt. This was completely a place she had never been to before. They were asking you some pretty tough questions. The toughest questions of my entire life. I was accused of things that never even crossed my mind. Like what? Murdering him, cheating on him, scamming the public for donation money. Could this be another domestic murder? Sweet little Christine behind her husband's death? They ask her about life insurance and all those donations. Detective Holland leans back in his chair and puts his leg up and he kind of chuckles at me and smiles. And, and he's like, come on, Christine. Tell me what's going on. Did you scam the public? I was outraged that he was accusing me of that. And she got out of it. She got indignant that yes. you were asking her these questions. Yes, and that is something that we were watching very closely. She was insulted. Absolutely. All I wanted was my husband to be found. Leave me alone. Find my husband. A clue is uncovered in the search for a missing SeaTac man. Will a rush of new leads clear Christine? Everything changes after a search of Nicholas's office desk turns up a disturbing receipt. There were condoms on the receipt. I said, there's no way. I said, I'm pregnant. We have not used condoms. Stay with us. Where is a 28-year-old devoted father of two? Hello, everybody. There has been a big break in the search for a missing SeaTac father. Nicholas Francisco's red Toyota had just been found six days after he disappeared on his way home from work. But when detectives search it, 
they are hit with another surprise. As far as foul play was concerned, anything in the car, was there any sign of struggle? No. No blood? No. Dogs are brought out to try and find Nick scent, but nothing. Still, the community does not give up. It gave us some more hope, so we actually got another search party together right there in the middle of the condo complex at night. Bring him home soon, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 It was pretty heartwarming to see this many people want to get involved. Christine, thank you for being with us. Absolutely. Christine takes to the airwaves, trying her best to keep the search fresh. According to my research, your husband has no history whatsoever of disappearing. You're right. He wouldn't do this. Even if he was 15 minutes late in traffic, he would call me. But not this time. This time, Nick is gone. Detective Holland checks every dead body that turns up in the area and tries for days to get Nicholas's cell phone records, but can't get permission from the court. In the words of one of the judges, it's not against the law to become a missing person. If you had a murder scene, you would have been able to get the cell phone records right away. That would have had him in a day. But police are much luckier at Nicholas's job site. Here, they are allowed to search his office, and what they find changes everything for the detectives and even more for Christine. They said, well, we found a receipt on his desk. And I'm like, okay, so what? Everybody has receipts. And they said, well, it's what was on it. There were condoms on the receipt. I told the detective he was mistaking. I said, there's no way. I said, I'm pregnant. We've been trying for a year to have a baby and I finally got pregnant. We have not used condoms. The person at the register made a mistake. Christine's life is crashing down around her. First condoms she knew nothing about. Then on Nick's computer, evidence from financial records that her beloved and trusted husband is hiding money in a secret account. That account was used to pay for things he didn't want me to know about. She can see from records that he's been eating out while she's been struggling to feed the kids. And back at the police station, Detective Holland has finally obtained those cell phone records. And where'd you find out? Nicholas Francisco had a double life. Nick had been living a secret life making calls to other women he was dating on the side. How awkward was it to have to put it in black and white to her that her husband had a second life? It was either that or deliver the other news and that he was a victim of a homicide or foul play. Detective Holland showed her evidence that Nick was not only cheating, he was a player, a swinger, with internet names like Funtime Steven and Horny Steven. His MySpace page listed his interests as women, couples, sex, nudity, and his sexual orientation as bi. Some of that money in the secret account was used to pay for adult websites specializing in hooking up. He was soliciting sex. He put pictures of himself out. When I saw those pictures, I felt so sick. I just, it, it was too much. It was just too much. Clues lead police and Christine to an Anything Goes sex club in Seattle, salaciously called The Wet Spot, as well as a local bar where he met swingers at their weekly parties. I feel like an idiot. How did I not see this stuff? So there were red flags when you look back. When I would call him on his cell phone when he was supposed to be working late, there would be loud noise in the background. I'd say, well, what's that? Because I'm like, it sounds like you're at a bar. No, 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 I'm in the kitchen and, you know, somebody's doing dishes and stupid me believed him. Now the evidence was too hard to deny. Police had cleared Christine of any notion of foul play, but she was torn between, okay, he's alive, and I wish he was dead. I'm being asked to choose between two bad situations. And yeah, the one that would hurt the least would be that he was dead, because that means that he didn't actually choose to leave me and my children, that he didn't actually choose to walk away. Christine soon files for divorce, making Nick an official deadbeat dad. She gives birth to their third child, a baby son. Police kept looking. They made Nick the king of spades in a missing person's card deck. But the case loses momentum. Until Christine gets a phone call that nearly floors her. A state bureaucrat wants her to know she has a child support check waiting for her. And I said, are you kidding me? 
who's the check from? And I said, I need to know if this came from my ex-husband because I need to know if he's alive or not. And she told me, she said, it says that it's from Nicholas Stephen Francisco. Nick, hiding away for about a year now under an assumed name, finally made a mistake. He opened a bank account in faraway Los Angeles and Washington State's computers flagged it and confiscated his money. Nick was not pleased and even had the gall to try and get the money back before closing the account and disappearing again. I would have expected him to have the character to at least man up and be, hey, this isn't gonna work, but I'm still gonna support my kids. Not Nick. He doesn't even want to see pictures of his kids when we track him down outside his new home in Los Angeles. Show you a couple pictures maybe you want to see of your kids. Tell us why you would, it's near almost Father's Day, and why you wouldn't uh, want to see them or abandon them? Can you tell us at all about what, uh, what happened? Why'd you leave? We tried to ask how he could tear his family apart like this, but he wasn't in the mood to share his secrets. This from a man whose own father left his family when Nicholas was 16. He yawned. Are you serious? I'm serious. That hurts that we meant nothing to him. I think that's the only way he can deal with what he's done. If he engages at all, the weight of the whole situation hits him. And so he completely pushes it all away so that he doesn't have to feel any of it. Nicholas Francisco won't speak for himself now, although one Seattle reporter did manage to ask him if he felt guilty about wasting everybody's time, energy, and sympathy. His answer, no, they did it for selfish reasons. It doesn't surprise me. It's what people do. They want to feel good about themselves that they're, they're doing something. Not exactly what those friends and co-workers who spent their nights and weekends searching for what they now label a deadbeat wanted to hear. I think we were all pretty pissed off, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, it's like, wow, you've got to be kidding. You just feel like you've been played for a fool, and now he's going to get away with it. Ex-wife Christine lost their house to foreclosure. She's remarried and now lives with the kids squeezed into a basement apartment while forced as a co-borrower to pay Nicholas's student loans on her own. He hasn't given her another cent, <laughs> leaving her to explain the unexplainable to her three children. She still remembers that. Oh, yeah. We remember the good memories, and we cry together about the good memories. Money! <laughs> And then she always asks at the very end, why did daddy leave? My answer is the same, because he decided he didn't want to be a daddy or husband anymore. As of 2011, Nick Francisco remains estranged from his family. Christina Carter says she has not received any further child support payments. Meanwhile, authorities maintain they do not have the time or the resources to pursue Francisco. I'm John Quinones. Join us next time for another edition of 2020 on ID.